Hi, I'm Nancy Howell with the Education Division at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and I want to welcome all of you to Scientist Saturday today, May 9th, and uh, it's going to be an exciting uh, today, day today. Um, we have Dr. Andy Jones, our museum curator of ornithology, but you know, I know a lot of you are probably still sticking around home, which is always a good thing. And you've been watching the process of nature going by uh, this, uh, this whole uh, lockdown. And maybe you've been watching your, your bird feeder, maybe looking at the plants in your yard, um, which is, which is kind of nice because you're now seeing the things that are happening right around your neighborhood. And uh, it, what is happening right now is bird migration. And the uh, migrants are going to be coming through. Now, of course, we have some interesting weather patterns that we've been experiencing. It's a little cooler than normal, but migrants are coming through. And that is really what uh, is going to be shared with us today on uh, Scientist Saturday. And I want to welcome Dr. Andy Jones, the museum curator of ornithology at the museum. And he's also the William A. and Nancy R. Clam Chair of Ornithology. So good afternoon, Andy. So glad you could join us. Good afternoon, Nancy. Good to see you on this uh, really strange, cool uh, May afternoon. Oh, it's May, huh? I thought it was November. <laughs> We had we had a bit of snow in the yard. Maybe some of our viewers did too. And I just thought it was kind of unusual to see a Baltimore Oriole at my feeder uh, in the snow. It just was not normal. Uh, so really, uh, today we are going to be taking a look at a, a lot of different topics. But but let's first get uh, clarify things a little bit about uh, what a curator of ornithology does and some things about the collections. Sure. Uh, a curator is a museum scientist who is tasked with doing research as well as curating a collection. And so for an ornithologist, that means I curate uh, a collection of about 37, 38,000 specimens that are behind the scenes. So when you walk through the museum, you see taxidermy mounts. Those are sort of artful ways to display birds. That's not what I'm curating. Uh, behind the scenes, we have what we'd call round specimens or round skins. And uh, we have tens of thousands of those. Uh, we have some skeletal material, we have nests and eggs. And importantly, all of these specimens have a tag attached to them. And the tag tells us what species it is, where it came from, when it came from, and there might be lots of other information like measurements or breeding condition or what was in its stomach if it was a skin and that sort of thing. So curating a collection means I have to make sure that collection stays in great shape. That means there are specimens that are 150 or more years old that I need to make sure they're still available 150 years from now. Uh, and I also uh, am growing the collection. So the collection grows uh, uh, by a few thousand birds a year. And I want to make these available for my own research. But importantly, we are a community resource, and so these uh, specimens are available to the research community at large. Well, that's great to know. Um, maybe some of our viewers have been behind the scenes at some of our behind the scenes evenings. Maybe we're getting viewers from other parts of the country or the world. So our, our collection at the museum, is it uh, local? Is it just Ohio, United States, the world? Yeah, it's all of that, uh, considering our museum is about 100 years old now, uh, and the collections actually predate the museum. A lot of the material we have um, represents Ohio history, and we have very strong holdings from Cuyahoga County, where we're located, as well as the neighboring counties. But the museum has also carried out uh, expeditions locally, regionally, and around the world. Uh, some of our viewers might be familiar with the Blossom Expedition, where uh, the museum had a ship go through uh, the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we've also had other expeditions to Africa and other parts of the world. And we have material from all of those trips. So for me, if I want to study something that's local, uh, like a black-capped chickadee, we have lots of specimens, lots of vouchers for that. 
But if researchers are interested in looking at the biology of a bird called a roller in Cape Verde Islands, we have specimens of those as well. Wow. Is there, is there a particular specimen that is the most exotic in our collection, at least exotic to, to you? I have lots of favorites. Uh, I, there's, it'd be hard to pick the favorite. Uh, we do have a couple of specimens that actually came from John James Audubon's personal collection. Uh, so when he passed away, his material was kind of dispersed among a few museums and through trades, we ended up with a few of his, including a cackling goose. And that's, that's one of my favorites. I, I just love seeing that specimen and knowing this could be a specimen he had in mind as he was making his famous paintings. Uh, that's, that's a pretty incredible thing. Uh, we have a few other specimens that I like because of the, the collector name associated with them. Uh, maybe another sort of oddball interesting one is a flycatcher called a dusky flycatcher. And it's from the Western US and its scientific name is Impidinax oberholseri. Well, these are really hard to identify. And if you look carefully on the tag, you'll see that a previous curator had confirmed that it was identified correctly. So in the 1940s, Dr. Harry Oberholzer confirmed that that bird species that was named after him was uh, identified correctly. So I like that sort of circular history with uh, that particular specimen. No, that's, that's great. Cause you know, the collections, like you say, are more, more than just scientific, it's that the story behind so many of them. Um, so how does it, the museum get its, its specimens uh, in the collection? Yeah, most of the growth in our collections nowadays is from rehabilitation centers. Uh, so we've got a really nice relationship with a number of rehabilitation centers in Northern Ohio. Um, we work especially closely with Lake Erie Nature and Science Center in Bay Village. And for years, they've been uh, preserving, you know, if they bring, if a bird comes in injured and they can't save it, they have to euthanize it or it just dies in, in captivity, then they freeze the bird and they transfer it to us. And they've been great partners because they record all of the information we really would like to have, like where the bird came from, what the exact date was, did they feed it or not? Because we actually look in the stomachs to see what was in that bird's diet. And then more recently, We've worked with them even more closely because of the Lights Out Cleveland program. Uh, and so they are a, a key partner. Uh, they're a founding partner of this Lights Out uh, Cleveland effort. And now we're getting thousands of birds a year uh, from that collision uh, project. I think we'll be hearing a little bit more about the Lights Out Cleveland uh, project uh, a little bit later. But uh, before we go to the video, uh, the, the um, specimen spotlight video, I do want to remind our viewers that please send in uh, questions and I can pose those to Andy throughout the uh, program. Um, I may not get to them all. I may leave some towards the end. So again, please send in your questions. We'd love to have them. So I think we're ready to go to our specimen spotlight video. Hi, and welcome to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History's Specimen Spotlight. I'm your host, Lee Hall, and today we are very excited to be in the collections for the Department of Ornithology. Welcome to Specimen Spotlight. Today we're here with Dr. Andy Jones, the Curator of Ornithology and Director of Science Hi, Andy. Hey, Lee. Thanks for having us today. Absolutely. So uh, what did you pick for Specimen Spotlight? Uh, I picked a viri. Uh, so the specimen in front of us is a viri, which is a type of thrush. They nest around North America and winter in South America. Okay. And so uh, particularly, why did you pick a viri? So this one, I think, is a great example of how we do modern collecting. Um, this is a specimen that typically we would have something like this, which is a round skin and that is the standard for research. But nowadays we're trying to save as much material as possible. So okay. we do have a spread wing. 
Uh, the spread wing looks, lets us look at things like molt patterns and also aerodynamics on the birds. We can look at the wing really? shape and understand how, how well they uh, function as migrants. So did you take, this is a wing from this bird here. That's right. I see there's one wing still on. Yes, yeah, so we're there, missing a wing on the other side. Why don't you take both wings off? Uh, so you might have a researcher studying the attachment points on the wing, or they might be looking at other aspects of how it would sit naturally on the body. Okay. But for aerodynamics, we just need the one. So we, we just take a single wing off. So there's there's a, a good deal of vials here on the table. What what exactly is going on with these? Yes, yeah, so we've saved a lot of material from this bird, including uh, a tissue sample. So this is pretty standard now. We take part of the heart and part of the breast muscle, and this would stay frozen at negative 60 Celsius. Really? We can take a little piece of that material take it into the lab and get DNA sequence from this bird. Or if a researcher from another institution wants to borrow that, we can send, excuse me, send them a little piece of tissue and they can work with it there at their lab. Okay. Um, in addition to that, we have the stomach from the bird. Um, there are researchers studying diet, and so we've taken the whole stomach out and preserved it in alcohol. Oh, wow. And then we've saved the liver from this bird, and there are researchers that study what tick-borne diseases birds have encountered, and they can actually study that by looking at parts of the liver. So how do you determine or choose what organs to preserve from these birds? So the, the basic level that just about everybody does is heart and breast muscle, because that's the best for DNA. Uh, a lot of people work with mitochondrial DNA. There's a lot of mitochondria in the heart, so that's why we save the heart. Yeah. What is in this large jar uh, so, here? So this one's pretty unusual. This is actually the full uh, trachea, the windpipe from the bird, including the tongue and the beginning of the lungs. So this bird has a really beautiful song, and not much has been done on how they produce that song or how that song varies from place to place. And so we have recordings of viris from all over the U.S., and we've published papers on, on how these birds actually communicate with each other. And now we're trying to do some of the anatomical work to understand how they produce this really cool song. So would you blow air through the specimen? No. <laughs> <laughs> so once they're pickled, uh, they've shrunk down and don't function anymore. But hmm. this would be more for doing microscopic dissections and looking at the actual singing apparatus. Okay. So instead of a, uh, a larynx like we have, they have a syrinx down in the chest that produces sound. And so we'll take a close look at that later. Fascinating. Is this fairly standard for the um, the data that you will retain from the birds here? Uh, this, this one's pretty exceptional because we have outside researchers wanting to work on some of these um, samples, but we typically save at least the skin, the wing, the tissue, often the stomach, and then it's only in special cases we might go beyond that. Although increasingly we're doing what's in this last vial, which is ectoparasites. Ooh. So we actually have uh, mites and lice that came off of this bird. Really? So they're, they're feeding on the feathers of themselves, or they might actually be biting the bird on the skin and trying to get blood. And we preserve those because there's also people doing a lot of research on, on uh, parasites on birds. Some of those are specific to the species of bird they live on. So these could actually be lice that only live on viris. So when you collect a viri, you're also collecting a microscopic ecosystem. That's right. That's wow, right. that's really cool. Yeah. Well, Andy, that was really interesting, and thank you so much for your time and for having us today for Specimen Spotlight. Absolutely. Thanks. Always enjoy going into the lab, Andy, and, and I'm sure our viewers um, were looking at the background. Those, those what things in the background is, are where your collections are stored, and I think we have a couple of images of some of the things that you do have uh, in the drawers in the collections. Isn't that right? Yeah, we have over 100 uh, cabinets uh, with collected material. So we have collections of all kinds, including the nests and eggs and the, the skins. Um, we have a, a pretty nice series of nests and eggs that we've highlighted recently on the museum blog. Uh, there's a great history associated with some of these where they were collected over 100 years ago. Uh, the ones you're, I believe, seeing on the screen now are some gull eggs, and these are really cool. They're, they're, uh, each of those boxes has a single clutch of eggs from a single individual, and you'll notice they're almost always three eggs. And when gulls go to incubate, they actually lose feathers on their bellies and it's in three little circular shapes that perfectly fit on those three eggs. So it's a really 
efficient way to keep their uh, their eggs warm. But yeah, those eggs are preserved. The uh, insides of the egg have been removed. There's a tiny little hole that you can't really see on these. And when it's just down to the eggshell, that is material that will last a very long time. And everything is in a cabinet. The cabinet prevents uh, any direct light from getting to the specimens to make the color fade. So those eggshells are as uh, vibrant today as they were when they were collected 100 years ago. Uh, and then, of course, it minimizes any impact from humidity change. And, you know, in the, the we always fear bugs being loose in the museum and doing damage. But all of these really important specimens are in uh, very specific uh, manufactured cabinets that are made just for museum specimens that uh, fully seal and keep these uh, these specimens uh, safe. I think you also have some so bird specimens. There they are. Yes. I'm looking at them on the screen. Yeah, these are uh, Connecticut warbler samples. Uh, this is uh, what I was referring to earlier as a round skin or a study skin. Uh, the bird has had all of its insides removed except for a couple of bones, like the bones in the base of the legs and the beak. And we just put cotton back inside and sew them closed. And you can see these, they look, you know, fairly lifelike if a Connecticut warbler was to decide to take a nap on its back, I suppose. But here you can see the, the tags that tell us uh, a little more information about the bird. And I'm not sure if the viewers at home can see it, but all of these are actually from Cleveland from the early 1930s. And each one of them actually collided with the terminal tower downtown as they were migrating. Uh, and so these are, this is a species that's somewhat common, but very hard to detect. They're, they're what we call skulkers. They spend a lot of time uh, in the bushes and in deep cover, and they're hard to get a good look at. But uh, they are coming through. And unfortunately, uh, from these collision studies, we do know that they're passing through Cleveland in decent numbers. A question has come in uh, about the bird's eggs and the, the skins themselves. And uh, the question is, does the museum encourage people to bring in eggs or uh, dead birds if they find them? Yeah, we, we don't really do a lot with nests and eggs nowadays. There's a little bit of research requests that I feel, but not too much. So we, we don't, uh, you know, especially if they're active, of course, you can't touch them. And uh, all birds are protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Uh, whether they're migratory or not, all native birds are protected. So you have to have permits uh, to uh, possess them or handle them. And of course, this museum has permits. So if you do find a dead bird, you can bring it to the museum uh, and drop it off as long as you know where it came from and when it came from. Uh, although I would say we're taking a pause with that activity uh, while the COVID uh, issues are going on, uh, it's, it's, we can't do social distancing and also transfer a bird carcass. So uh, we're currently asking that nobody salvage birds. Uh, we're not accepting anything during the shelter and home uh, order. All great information. Thank you. Because I think a lot of our viewers would probably be uh, curious about, well, gee whiz, I had a bird strike my window or, oh, I found this egg on the ground, you know, that kind of stuff. So, so good information. Um, now, migration is occurring right now. Uh, a lot of people want to be out and about. And I know you've been active in uh, learning more about migration, uh, the, the Viri, and you talked about in the uh, specimen spotlight. And um, I know that we kind of watch weather and radar is to telling us when birds are coming through. So tell me, tell us a little bit more about how we're able to determine uh, when a good migration day would be. So it would be exciting for to be out in your yard. So, so what's the opposite of a day like today? Um, <laughs> we, uh, we, we're watching for spring migration uh, all throughout well, for some species, it starts as early as mid-February, and it goes through early June for a, a couple of longer distance migrants, our neotropical migrants. And a lot of our smaller birds, the songbirds or the perching birds, another name for them, uh, most of those migrate at night and they navigate by the stars and they come in when the winds are right. And so last night I looked uh, to see what the wind 
forecast was, and it was out of the north all night long, more than 10 miles an hour. And if you're a bird that weighs less than pocket change, uh, you're not going to fly at night with a, a heavy wind like that. So we wait for the winds to turn. And when we think conditions are right, we can confirm that we're right, not only by going birding, but by looking at weather, uh, weather radar. So that same NEXRAD image like you're seeing on the screen, there's the darker green and yellows that represent storms moving through. But weather radar is actually able to pick up bird migration too. So all of those round halos you see, like there's a sort of halo over the Cincinnati area that I can see, a couple over Oklahoma, and then all along the Gulf Coast. Each of those circles are not representing precipitation. That's actually bird migration. And they're in circles like that because that's how far each of the individual NEXRAD stations can survey. So uh, I believe our next image will show us what really heavy migration looks like. Yeah, here we go. So these are the nights birders dream of. Uh, this was, you can see from my screenshot, I took this at 11.34 p.m. Uh, I believe this was last week when we had some nice weather and the migrants were coming in and they were covering up all of Eastern North America. So the density of migration is pretty incredible. And this might represent millions of birds on the wing and when you're like me and you see that at 1130, you set your alarm clock a little earlier the next morning because it's time to go out and go birding. A uh, question did come in about uh, these, this radar. Is there a link that people can go to to see this themselves? Yeah, it, really any weather app. Uh, on your phone or any weather website you might look at. If you, with practice, you can see where there's bird migration. Uh, but I believe we can share in the chat or on the screen, there's a, a weather.gov link that I really like. So uh, one of the US government's uh, uh, websites actually lists a number of regional uh, views of migration. And the nice thing about this link is it'll take you to an animated loop. So it'll show you like three hours of history of what was happening. So if you wake up at 6 a.m., you can actually look at the loop and see what the last few hours of migration look like. And that'll be a pretty good indicator of how strong it's gonna be. So yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, weather.gov. You can explore that website like wild. There's a, a lot of ways to look at, at radar data there, but the, the loops are, are especially helpful. Fantastic. Um, now, today is also World Migratory Bird Day, and I think you have a special thing that you're going to be doing today called a big sit. Tell us a little bit more about that and, and who you're working with doing that. Yeah, yeah the, the Saturday before Mother's Day every year is uh, World Migratory Bird Day. So uh, as part of that recognition, there's there are historically are festivals. Of course, a lot of that has been canceled this year. Um, but we still are celebrating that day by getting out and seeing as many migratory birds as we can. And so I was tapped by the Ohio Young Birders Club, uh, and they decided to have everybody participate and try and accumulate as many species as possible uh, across the state by birding locally. So we don't want to encourage anybody to go out. And of course, places like McGee Marsh and other famous birding sites are completely closed. You can't even go there legally, but we don't want to encourage long distance travel. So everybody is supposed to stay within five miles of their home and strongly prefer that you just travel by foot or by bike. Uh, but if you're like me and you have a couple of Zoom meetings happening today, then uh, you're going to spend your time birding your yard instead. And so that's what I've been doing. I was wearing my winter coat <laughs> this morning and drinking a coffee to try and wake up and stay warm first thing and looking for migrants. And it's always tough in early May when you get zero warblers, uh, but that's how my day has gone so far. I do have white-throated sparrows coming through. That's one of my favorite birds. They're still singing away. Um, I was amazed about nine o'clock this morning, a ruby crown kinglet male burst into full song. Um, that's a bird that winters in the Southern US and they're heading up to the boreal forest. They usually are mostly out of here by early May and especially the males, they move first to get on territory. So it's weird for one to still be here this late. 
but with snow coming down for one to still be in full song that was uh that was the highlight of my morning so far that's pretty amazing um i know ruby crown kinglets are not much bigger than a hummingbird and you know their metabolism is like crazy high but i bet they run into snow up in the boreal forest once they they get up there um you know so this is nothing nothing to them yes yeah they, they are really flexible they do deal with colder temperatures and i've actually gotten to see a behavior from them that i wasn't aware of before uh about a week ago when it was warmer i was sitting out in the yard and grilling dinner and we have a, a small yew tree and a yellow-bellied sapsucker had been coming to that tree for the last week or so. So that's a that's a migratory species of woodpecker, and they are sap suckers. They they will tap and make these horizontal lines of dots on a tree trunk, and that makes the sap actually flow out. The sapsucker will drink the sap, and they'll also eat bugs that are attracted to the sap. Well, while I was sitting there watching that, I also saw a ruby crown kinglet come in. And it started hovering right in front of those sap wells. I don't know if it was getting the bugs or drinking the sap or maybe both. Um, but I'd never seen that behavior before. And I looked it up in the, the ornithology literature. It is a known uh, behavior, but just with the shelter at home orders, I've been spending so much more time paying attention to every bird in my yard. Uh, it's been really rewarding to see these sort of less common behaviors out of common birds. Fascinating. That's great. So again, sticking around your yard, you, it's just amazing what you will find. And I know one other thing that deals with a migration is the lights out Cleveland. And I know that's a little bit put on hiatus for this spring, but tell us a little bit more about lights out Cleveland and migration patterns uh, through the city. Yeah. So we've, as you saw from the specimens, we know that birds have been colliding with buildings. Uh, throughout history. And so we are particularly worried about this happening nowadays and on events like the one you see here. Uh, so this image is showing downtown Cleveland. Um, remember these small migratory birds are navigating by the stars, but if the stars are not visible and it's really cloudy and foggy like this, they actually misnavigate and get confused by city lights. And so we were concerned about this as a problem for a while and it was only a few years ago that we formed a, a group called Lights Out Cleveland. And I want to give a shout out to Tim Jasinski. Uh, he works at the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. He's their rehabilitator there. And he really single handedly said, I know this is a problem. I see the injured birds coming to the rehab facility. We need to do something about it and monitor the whole downtown area. So he started going out at 5 a.m. on his days off and also the days he had a full time job that, to go in and started monitoring and sharing what he was finding on social media. Within months, we had five organizations that were working together and we have volunteer coordinators and uh, we've now had over 100 volunteers help us out by monitoring downtown, walking loops through downtown, checking uh, all the buildings. It's not a single building that's causing the problem. It's kind of a widespread issue, the fact that we have so many lights. And then the birds get distracted by the lights and come into downtown Cleveland. And actually downtown Cleveland can be great for birding. So the image you're seeing now shows you that, yeah, there's plenty of green space. This is the mall and there's lots of nice trees and shrubs. And maybe you see Brown Stadium in the distance. So the lake would be behind that. But here's the trick. Let me uh, zoom out on that same photo. And that was actually a reflection of a view of nice habitat. So if you're a bird that's gotten confused and ended up in downtown Cleveland at dawn, you've flown all night, you've got to find food. So you're moving from little green space to green space, finding as much food as you can. And we believe that what happens is these birds are in a tree or a shrub, they try and fly to the next tree or shrub, but instead they're seeing the reflection of the one that they're in. So we got this one, two punch, we have lights, we have reflective glass and you see the problem here, right? There's, there's three uh, dead warblers and one injured warbler all sitting below the single uh, window in downtown. Uh, it's not just a downtown issue. This happens everywhere. Everybody with a, 
a home or an apartment or anything like that that has reflective glass that faces towards green space uh, can actually be a, a potential problem for birds, but it's really these big gatherings of lighted structures like we get in downtown areas uh, that are causing a, a big issue for birds. So this whole program is about rehabilitating injured birds and then the birds that are found dead or don't survive are brought to the museum. I knew this would be hundreds of birds, but this team, like this, the crew that's shown here, they go out every morning in spring and fall migration, and they are now finding thousands of birds a year. Uh, we were asking earlier about how our collection grows, and it's by about 2,000 dead birds a year just from the Lights Out Cleveland effort in downtown. That's kind of sad in a way, but you know, it's adding to our scientific knowledge by adding to the collection, um, you know, and we hope that maybe we can, the Lights Out Cleveland information can help the uh, uh, managers of the buildings downtown to maybe dim the lights or whatever will keep that collision from happening. But the data is sorely needed. So we thank all those those hardworking volunteers, yep, they'll be getting back to it. And this is done in spring and in fall normally. Isn't that right, Dr. Jones? That's right. Yeah, we're we're taking the spring off. Uh, we are we just for social distancing reasons. We don't want to have handoff of, you know, birds and that sort of thing. So it's suspended for the spring. It'll start again uh, probably August 15th, assuming things are a little closer to normal at that point. Or maybe we'll have other um, sorts of protections in place. But yeah, it's a spring and fall thing. We're finding the, the birds, we're making the best of a bad situation here at the museum. So we're not asking for 2,000 dead birds to come to us, but if they're gonna come, we're, we're gonna use them for research. Um, you're currently seeing a couple of our volunteers on our big sorting day. Uh, so this was processing all of 2018's birds, not making specimens, but just sorting them out by species. So we had to put 2,000 frozen carcasses on all these tables and sort them out. You might see some of the banding codes. I see a Swainson's thrush down there at the front. Um, and so we organize them and then we'll have our volunteers. So beyond the volunteers helping downtown, we also have volunteers prepping specimens for us at the museum. And it might be Swainson's thrush day or Ruby crown kinglet day or something like that, where everybody prepares a bunch of the same birds. So the collection grows. Um, and we've actually been using this information to work with building owners and managers. We have some successes. If you look on the Ohio Lights Out website, it's just ohiolightsout.org, uh, you can see the list of our participating buildings. Um, and so it's some prominent buildings downtown that are voluntarily turning their lights off from uh, midnight till, till first light. And we really appreciate that. That makes a, a difference. We've had a couple of sites where there were lots of collisions on just a single facade of a building and working with the managers they were able to adjust lighting or in some cases adjust some of the greenery around those buildings and that's had an impact by uh, decreasing the number of collisions so it's all about it's about rehabilitating the birds it's about uh, collecting data for museum specimens and it's also about trying to make cleveland a safer city for bird migration That's wonderful. And uh, also, you know, being not just the city being safer for birds, but how can maybe your yard or neighborhood become a little bit more bird friendly or bird safe? Uh, you know, a lot of these birds are heading from South or Central America, the Caribbean, and they're heading, like you say, up to the Canadian boreal forest, but they need the fuel and need the rest areas and our yards and neighborhoods can provide that. So. So what are some good tips that you can provide on making your yard a little bit more bird friendly? I think, uh, I think what would leap to my mind first and probably most people as well is putting up bird feeders. So providing actual food. Uh, I recommend um, putting out black oil sunflower seed. Um, that's a really powerful punch for a bird. They get a lot of energy from a single black oil sunflower seed. Um, it's good to buy those from a store that has higher turnover with the seed because sometimes you'll find some of the big box stores have already um, uh, they've had sort of uh, rancid 
uh, seeds because they've been there for so long. I've had some have just thrown out, but putting that out is great for birds. You can also put out uh, Niger or black uh, thistle seed. That's the really tiny seeds that finches will come into. Uh, American goldfinches really like that. And uh, uh, the rose-breasted grosbeaks are coming into my feeders right now for black oil sunflower seeds. Uh, so putting out food is great. Uh, providing water is important. Um, this tends to be even more important in the fall when it's drier and birds might have dehydration issues while migrating. And so providing fresh water, whether that's a bird bath or a pond or, or just being closer to a stream, uh, that can also be a way to watch the birds bathe, which is uh, always fun. But beyond that, and I think the thing that's more impactful is if you are managing a yard, uh, fill it with native plants and fill it with plants that maybe provide fruits, berries in the fall, but are just native species because that provides insects for birds to eat. So a lot of birds, even ones that we think of as seed eaters over the winter, will switch to a diet of live insects during the warm months. And that's especially true when they're feeding their babies. They want to provide things like caterpillars, which are a uh, uh, a great little packet of energy to feed a, a growing baby bird. And uh, projects have looked at, at native versus non-native plants. Non-native plants just don't have the insect diversity on them. And that means that they don't provide the quality of food that our native birds need. One of the best things you can do is put out an oak tree. Oaks harbor more caterpillar diversity in numbers than other native trees. And so that's just a fantastic bit of food for, for the birds. So it's, it's shelter, it's food, um, uh, it's habitat, all that's important, regardless of how big your yard is. My yard is a half acre. I'm near some other woods, which is great, but my little half acre has hosted uh, many migratory birds, including warbler flocks in the spring and fall. And uh, they don't ever leave thank you cards, but I know they appreciate having uh, food to eat as they pass through the yard. Well, and they give you enjoyment too. So, and that's what you're, we're all uh, uh, experiencing at this time as we are sticking around a little closer to home. Um, all right, so I want to see these birds. Um, what kind of equipment might I need to get a little closer view? Yep, putting a bird feeder up, I can see them near the house, but uh, something's a little further away. How, how am I going to be able to tell what it is? Yeah, you can spend a little money or a whole lot of money uh, as a birder. Uh, there's lots of temptation for lots of technology and you'll see birders carrying around really big expensive cameras with long lenses and using a, a spotting scope on a tripod. But really all you need to get started is a pair of binoculars. Spending maybe 200 or $300 will get you a, a nice pair of binoculars that will last you many years. And you need to be careful as you buy them. I, uh, I think it's really important that you spend time with the binoculars practicing and making sure they're comfortable to you before you actually spend the money. So that means going to a store and going birding with them. Uh, some of the, the stores will actually let you take them out of the store. I think you leave your driver's license so you don't just take off with, that, with the binoculars. But the reason that's important is if you're looking through your binoculars in a store, everything is brightly lit and all binoculars seem great. But if you go outside, that's when you can look underneath a car or in a shady area to see, are they really making my image bright enough for me to see something? You also wanna see, is it comfortable in your hand? And also, is it comfortable against your face? And then as you scan around, is it giving you a headache or not? Some of the more poorly built or poorly aligned binoculars will actually give you a headache really quickly. So you want to avoid that. Um, I have my set of binoculars here. So uh, there's a couple things you want to look at when you're buying binoculars. And there's two numbers that every binocular has. The first number is something like a 7 or an 8 or a 10. And that's the amount of magnification. So the ones I'm using here are 8 power. That's the ones I find most comfortable. Uh, 10 power binocular, that sounds like it would bring the bird even closer to your eye, but the difference between eight times and 10 times is not that great. And I find that if I've been birding all day, I'm tired 
And that little bit of shake that I might have in my hand is being amplified by 10 times. Uh, those also tend to be just heavier binoculars than an eight power because there's thicker glass in them. So, you know, see what you like, but I really like eight powers. I've used 10 powers before. Um, they're great. I actually have had some that are eight and a half power, and that's a nice one. And then you want to look at the second number. So your binoculars might be something like seven by 35 or eight by 40. And that second number is actually the, the uh, diameter across the objective lens. So this width right here is actually a measure of how much light you can bring into the binocular. So if you're burning in a bright store, it doesn't matter, everything's bright. But if you're burning at dusk in your yard or you're in deep woods and you're looking around and you have little compact binoculars with a really tiny objective lens, you're not gonna see any color. So if you're standing next to somebody with nicer binoculars, they'll say, look at that indigo bunting. It's just incredibly blue. And you'll say, that dark gray bird, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't see the detail. And that's that's all about having a, a nicer set of binoculars. So you can spend thousands of dollars, uh, but you don't have to. Uh, like I say, 250, 300 bucks, that's going to get you a really nice set of binoculars. Yeah, I have mine handy here too, because I'm looking out a window and uh, yep, yep, keep them handy. That's an important thing. Um, and I think you can also do some, taking some photographs with your camera. Um, is that, Do we have a, a video that can show a little bit more, tell us a little bit more about that? spending time documenting some of the diversity of organisms showing up in our backyard and maybe contributing those to citizen science projects like iNaturalist and eBird. It's pretty easy to take photos of uh, plants and bugs in your yard, but to get pictures of birds is a little tougher if you don't have a really expensive uh, zoom lens for your camera. So I wanted to offer some tips on another way to do this, just using your cell phone and whatever binoculars you have handy. Let me switch this thing around and I'll show you what I mean. So currently there's a couple of species of birds coming to the feeder and that's really too far away to get a nice shot with my cell phone. What I can do is put my binoculars up. And if I keep that little bit of light that I can see in the center of the binoculars in the center of the camera, as I bring it close, carefully you can get a nice close clear video or take a photo of whatever bird showing up and just so happened to get her red-bellied woodpecker now I've got a couple of house finches sitting on the feeder as well with some practice you can get some pretty decent photos and videos of the birds coming into your feeder or showing up in your backyard I hope you'll give this a shot Please post whatever success you have down below. We'd love to see how you're doing. I've seen you do that, Andy, taking a video through your binoculars. Uh, you got you have way steadier hands than I do. Um, just before we're ready to end, a couple questions came in. One was about uh, what resources uh, are out there to help you identify birds. Uh, you know, you might have an apartment, um, you might have some birds coming that are a little further away, so you're, you're looking at them, but how do you identify them? What, what's a good resource? I, I think for sure the first thing to start out with is a good field guide. Um, there's a incredible number of field guides on the market right now. Uh, I personally use National Geographic's a lot, but I have a whole lot of them and, and rely on those. And so the nice thing about a field guide is it, it presents what's available. And so you can study them in advance and maybe know that there might be 20 some species of warblers that you could see uh, in your area. You can get familiar with those. And then when you go in the field, you'll know what to look for. But when you're first starting out, Everything's hard. This field guide is really thick. There's a, a hundreds of species that could potentially be in your neighborhood. And I, I know it's frustrating when you get going. I, I look at my old field notes from when I was in high school uh, and I had flocks of least flycatchers in my yard in November in Tennessee. 
they don't occur there in Tennessee. I now know those are ruby crown kinglets, and it took me months to figure out what those actually were. So don't get too frustrated to start out with. Um, if you have a mentor who can help you out, that's really uh, also a, a way to get up on that learning curve really quickly. But uh, so a field guide is a great start. There's also birding apps that you can use. Um, there's some great free ones out there. Two of them I'd recommend. Uh, one of them is called Merlin, uh, like the bird. Um, and that one will help you work through uh, bird identification and it helps favoring the common birds instead of overwhelming you with all these rare things that might be in your yard. Uh, and another app that I'd recommend, not just for birds, but for plants and insects and everything else is iNaturalist. Um, and that's another free app. And it will, it relies on you taking a photo. So if you have even a bad photo of a bird or a plant or anything else, and you put it into the app, it's going to use machine learning to try and identify that bird or violet or whatever it might be for you. And it's really remarkable. It's the same technology that you see on social media that'll help you recognize. Maybe it'll tag your face because it knows who you are. And it's, it's incredibly powerful. It's been uh, uh, trained by all of the other photos that other people have added. And so I've, I've put some really terrible photos up on iNaturalist and been amazed at its ability to correctly identify things, uh, especially when it's a common species in your neighborhood. It's, it's, it really performs really well. Wow, that's, that's great. Um, I'm glad that these resources are available, uh, whether they're apps or, or the actual guides. Um, there's a little bit of clarification. A couple of folks have posted, um, they want to know, again, what the larger number on the binoculars is called and you know, where that is on the, if you could refresh our memories. Sure, yeah, so the, the first number is magnification. The second number is objective lens. So this is the objective. The, the object you're looking at is the one, is the, the objective lens is closer to that. So that's gonna be measured in millimeters and it's the diameter across here. So you don't need to go measure it. Um, I don't actually see it on mine or I do, it's written, written extremely small. I don't believe you'll be able to see it, but this one is a eight by 42. So if you go in and say to a, a shop and just tell them you're, you're interested in a, a pair of birding binoculars, if they're familiar with that, they'll probably start you with the seven and eights uh, and hopefully they know that that second number should be larger. The rule of thumb is the second number should be five times what the first number is. Seven by 35 or higher, eight by 40 or higher, and 10 by 50 or higher. Uh, bigger than 10 by 50 is a, a pretty rare thing. But um, so an eight by 25 might feel like a nice compact binocular that you can carry around without much weight but you'll be disappointed uh, in, in poorer weather conditions. So you want that second number to be at least five times the first number. One thing I did forget to mention, I know we talked a little bit about some of the, the microbiome on a bird and some of the things you've been collecting. So uh, I understand that there's some things living on birds. So. Tell us a little bit more about that. And yeah. I know you showed us a vial. Yeah, um, yeah the, the vial uh, that we briefly showed in the, the specimen spotlight uh, was the parasites that live on a bird. So when you're currently seeing some wings off of birds as we prepare them for Lights Out Cleveland. But what I don't have a photo of is before we start to prepare it, we actually ruffle the feathers of the whole bird over a white piece of paper and any insect that was living on the bird that's now been frozen for maybe weeks or months is going to be dead and will drop off and we'll take a look at those under a microscope. And there is amazing diversity uh, of insects living on birds. So what you see now, that's a digiscoped photo, just like what we did with birding in the backyard, except that's through a microscope. That's why it's got that circle around it. And the line going across the center is the shaft of a single tail feather. And the little dots just above it are individual mites that are living on the feathers of that particular bird. And it's not just mites, we see lice 
And we see even other uh, strange things like this. This is a hippobosid fly or a flat fly. So this is a fly that is moving around on the skin of a bird. They will bite their skin and actually drink blood or eat the, eat the skin itself. They don't want to be caught by the bird, so they walk sideways through the feathers. It's really a strange uh, beast. I've had them uh, jump from a live bird that I was handling onto my arm, and that's kind of a terrifying feeling when this thing appears on you. They're, the tips of their feet are actually little hooks, and it's not like they dig into you, but they are very tight against your skin as they walk and they move sideways. You've never had a bug do that on you before. It's, it's pretty strange. Um, but that's one of the few parasites that's actually able to fly freely from bird to bird. Uh, the other one I want to show you is uh, a louse. So birds have lice that live on them. Some of them do bite skin or, or drink blood or just eat the feathers themselves, but there's no wings on that. And so for them to get from bird to bird requires that the birds actually touch each other or they might occasionally ride on one of those hippobosid flies. And that's something we've actually seen with our Lights Out Cleveland data set. So for every single of those 2000 dead birds we get per year, we are ruffling the feathers on every single bird and pulling all of the ectoparasites off of them. Because there are many ornithologists whose careers are just focused on parasite diversity on birds. Uh, this was something I knew nothing about 10 years ago. Uh, I started finding it interesting because as we would prepare specimens, occasionally you would see a, a strange bug. And then I've worked with uh, colleagues who are experts in this field and seeing all of these lights out birds, they said, you know, what other opportunities are there to systematically check birds for parasites? You can't do that easily on a live bird because some of these things are very tiny and they hide on the skin or within the feathers. But if the bird has died already, again, we're making the best of a bad situation. If we're gonna have all of these dead birds to process, let's make them as useful as possible to the research world. And so we're gonna actually prepare all of these mites and lice and bugs. We even look through their intestines as we prep them. And we even see small types of worms that live within their abdomen. Uh, and those get prepared as well. And we are working with colleagues who are studying uh, a number of different parasites on these birds. This has absolutely been fabulous, Andy. Uh, this, uh, I mean, you've covered so much information, just what our collections are about and what they do for other researchers as well as, as locally. So I, I think this has been fabulous. So I want to thank you so much and maybe get back to your, your big day of birding and see what else is in your yard. Um, but I also want Thanks, to mention Nancy, and, and that and next for, week. Thanks uh, relaying the questions from our, our uh, audience. I appreciate that as well. Sure, sure. That was easy. Um, but next week, I want to invite everybody to Scientist Saturday, and uh, that will be um, Dr. Michael uh, Donovan, who is going to be talking about the paleobotany collection. And if you don't know what paleobotany is, look it up before next Saturday. So thank you, Dr. Jones, appreciate it a lot. And from all of us at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, be safe and enjoy your neighborhood and the birds in your yard. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.